Hi, my name is Brian Heffler, and if you're watching this video, you probably saw me in the office regarding your neck or lower back. I realize that you may still have questions regarding your condition, so I created this video as a reference guide for you. In this video, I am going to review a representation of your films and describe your surgery in detail. I will go over all the post-operative care instructions and discuss treatment options that you could consider other than surgery. Lastly, we will go over all the risks and benefits of surgery, and I will hopefully answer any remaining questions that you may have had. Again, I want this video to be a recreation of your office visit and to be used as a reference guide for you, your family, and your friends. This picture is an MRI of the neck, and we're looking in from a side view. So to get you oriented, this would be the front of the neck, this would be the back of the neck. You can see the tongue and the chin would be here. The bottom of the brain is right here, so this would be up and this would be down. And again, we're looking in from the side. Now, there's seven bones of the cervical spine. The first bone is this little white uh, area right here, which is the smallest bone of your neck. This is the second bone, third bone, fourth bone, fifth bone, sixth bone, and seventh bone in your neck. And then these two bones down here are the first and second thoracic bones. In between the bones are the disc, which are the dark spaces between the bone. And then this gray structure here is the spinal canal. And around the spinal canal, you see this white stuff, which is spinal fluid around the spinal canal. So on this particular picture, you can see that this person has narrowing of the spinal canal at multiple levels, uh, which is representative of severe spinal stenosis. So if you look right here, you can see the disc here is bulging backwards and this dark stuff is ligament under the bone, which is pushing inward and it's pinching the spinal cord right here, causing severe narrowing of the spinal canal. And so at this point, you don't see any white around the spinal cord because the spinal cord is being pinched by these two structures. Down at these levels, you can see there's early severe narrowing as well, but not quite as bad as up at this level here. So this is a good example of severe spinal stenosis, particularly at this level right here. This is another view on the same MRI, but this time we're looking straight down the center of the spinal canal. So to get you oriented, this would be the front of the neck. This would be the back of the neck. The gray oval structure is the spinal cord and the white stuff around it, that white halo is spinal fluid around the spinal cord. So again, we're looking straight down the center of the spinal canal. So you can see at a normal level like this, there's plenty of white or spinal fluid around the spinal cord. And also note that the spinal cord looks nice and oval. Um, so that's a, that's a typical representation of a normal level in your neck. These are the same type of slices where we're looking straight down the spinal canal. So again, this is the front and this is the back. At the normal level, you can see there's a generous amount of white around the spinal cord which represents the spinal fluid. Also remember the spinal cord here looks nice and oval. As you come over to the level of spinal stenosis, you can immediately see that the spinal cord looks more like a boomerang. It's very flattened out and there's minimal remaining spinal fluid around the spinal cord. So this is an example of severe spinal stenosis. As we come to the next slice here, this is where the spinal stenosis is the worst. And you can see at this level, again, the spinal cord looks more like a boomerang compared to the normal side, but also you can see that there's no spinal fluid around the spinal cord anymore. And so this is severe, severe narrowing of the spinal canal at this level with pinching of the spinal cord. Lastly, I wanted to come back to the picture from a side view. Again, we're looking in from the side. This is the front and this is the back. You can see the areas of spinal stenosis here here and here. And I just wanted to give you an idea of what would happen uh, at surgery. So what I do at surgery is I basically remove the bone right off the back of the spine. And by taking that bone off the back of the spine, that opens up the spinal canal and that unpinches the spinal cord. Um, if you were to have a one level surgery done, I would take bone off the back of the spine just at this point. If you were to have a multi-level uh, surgery done for multi-level spinal stenosis, I would take bone off the back of the spinal canal at, mul at multiple levels. But this would be a good example of spinal stenosis and what I would do at surgery to open up your spinal canal. I wanted to use this model to show you a little bit about what I would do at surgery. 
So in this model, we're looking in from the back of the spine. So this is the back of the spine here. The white stuff represents the bone over the back of the spine. This structure right here is the spinous process, which is bone over the back of the spine. So if you ever felt the back of your neck and you feel those firm bumps, you're feeling one of these structures right here. Attached to the spinous process is the lamina, which is the bone here and here. And then these are the joints of the spine out to the side. So when I perform a laminectomy for spinal stenosis, typically what I do is I take off bone off the back of your spine. And so this whole area that I have checkered in um, on this picture is bone that's taken right off the back of the spine. By taking the bone off the back of the spine, that opens up the spinal canal and that unpinches your spinal cord. So when people have severe narrowing of the spinal canal and have severe spinal stenosis, I take bone off of both sides of the spinal canal to open up the spinal canal and unpinch the spinal cord. On occasion, someone will just need bone taken off of one side of the spine to partially unpinch the spinal cord and maybe unpinch the nerve. And so sometimes I'll just do a laminectomy on one side of the spine. But often for spinal stenosis and narrowing of the whole spinal canal, I'll take bone off of both sides. And so that kind of shows you what surgery would entail and what I would do at surgery using this model. Patients undergoing this type of surgery will either go home the same day or stay overnight. We will often make this decision together on the day of surgery. If you do go home the same day, I will discuss discharge instructions in detail with you and your family. This will include things such as wound care and dressing changes, activity after surgery, and follow-up instructions. If you do spend the night, then I will see you in the morning and we will go over these same discharge instructions at that time. I am including these instructions in this video for you to use as a reference guide. Now, let's discuss activity after surgery. I would ask you to keep your lifting light. I would like you to lift no more than five to 10 pounds for the first month after surgery. Just think about a gallon of milk weight-wise as a good rule of thumb and try to keep your lifting no more than that. You may be up walking around the house and go up and down stairs several times a day. If you feel up to it, uh, after several days, you could go out to dinner or even go to the grocery store for a short period of time. Walks no more than 30 minutes would be fine. If you drop something, you can certainly bend down and slowly pick it up. Uh, when you get to the point where your muscles start to ache or you feel fatigued and tired, you should sit down and rest. 
The first month after surgery, you will feel tired and maybe even feel exhausted. Uh, I think most people feel that way. In addition, you will most likely experience a degree of ongoing neck and shoulder discomfort. The intensity obviously varies from patient to patient. Overall, the majority of patients will feel tired and sore during the first month after surgery, so please expect this. Things I would like you to avoid uh, the first month after surgery would include things such as heavy lifting uh, and excessive bending. Remember, I would like you to lift no more than a gallon of milk weight-wise. I don't want you to formally exercise this month. The first month should be a time for you to take it easy and keep your activities light. Your body definitely needs time to recover. I would ask you to wait at least two weeks after surgery before getting back to driving. This is primarily because of pain and the use of pain medication. You should not drive while taking pain medication. Another important thing to remember is your symptoms that you had before surgery, particularly in your arms and legs, can fluctuate for the first two to four weeks after surgery. For all of these reasons, it isn't safe to drive for the first several weeks after surgery. You will be provided with pain medication and a muscle relaxant to go home with after surgery. Typically, I like to use Percocet or Norco for pain and Xanaflex as a muscle relaxant. Pain medication can often cause constipation, so I would recommend using an over-the-counter stool softener such as Colace or Pericolase. These medications can be purchased at your local drugstore and can help uh, prevent constipation. I also recommend that you drink plenty of water after surgery to keep yourself well hydrated. All of these measures will help to prevent constipation. For your specific surgery, I would like you to wear a soft neck brace for a period of two weeks after surgery. This will help to support your neck and ease the amount of discomfort that you have in your neck muscles. You will be provided with this neck brace before you leave the hospital. I would try to wear this brace as much as possible at home during the day. You don't need to wear the neck brace at night while sleeping, although I would say that the majority of my patients do wear the neck brace during the nighttime hours. Again, I would like you to use this neck brace for the first two weeks after your surgery. After your surgery, you will have several follow-up visits to my office. Your initial visit is typically at one month after surgery. At this visit, we will discuss increasing your activity. You can start light exercises, including light workouts such as uh, working on an elliptical machine, treadmill, stairmaster, or even a stationary bike. Light yoga, light stretching, and lifting of light free weights no more than 30 pounds would be fine. You can begin light housework, including pushing a sweeper or mopping the floor for up to maybe 15 to 30 minutes. Light laundry and cooking is fine. It would be fine to do light gardening outside or mow the grass for say 15 minutes. In the fall, you could rake the leaves, and in the winter, even shovel very light snow for 10 to 15 minutes. Walking is fine, but not to exhaustion. I would avoid jogging for at least another two to four weeks at this point in time. The most important thing after surgery is giving your body time to heal. If you do too much activity too soon, you could strain your muscles and cause yourself undue increased pain. The need for physical therapy will be determined based upon how you are feeling uh, at your one month visit. Some people require physical therapy and others don't. If you do undergo physical therapy, I typically include a six week course consisting both of water therapy in a warm pool and the other half land based therapy. Additionally, we will check your incision to make sure you are healing properly. And lastly, I will answer any remaining questions that you have regarding your surgery. The first month after surgery is very tiring and you need to expect it. You will be worn out and maybe even exhausted. You won't have your normal energy levels and that's perfectly normal during this time period. You typically will have a second post-operative visit to my office uh, three months after your surgery. If you are doing well at this visit, I would release you back to near normal activity. Activities such as golf, tennis, jogging, biking, 
and even riding a motorcycle are all examples of activities that you could start now. However, I may hold restrictions for a bit longer for people who engage in aggressive activities such as long distance running, vigorous exercise programs like P90X, or activities that involve heavy lifting. At your three month visit, I will re-examine you, including checking your incision, and I will answer any remaining questions you may have. On occasion, you may require a third visit if you are having problems or you need additional x-rays for some reason. Typically, I will see you back six months after surgery for this extra visit. If we did discuss treatment options other than surgery, these may have included things such as physical therapy, including water and land-based therapy. We may have talked about working with a chiropractor, massage therapy, acupuncture, traction, and treatment through pain management, including the option of steroid injections. Although these non-surgical options are available, they are usually not long-term solutions when you have pain or symptoms due to a pinched nerve or pinched spinal cord. As with any surgery, there are risks. We talked about many of these risks during the office visit. Typical risks for your lower back surgery would include things such as bleeding, infection, nerve injury, permanent weakness, paralysis, no change or worsening of your symptoms, recurrence of symptoms requiring further surgery, there could be an injury to a blood vessel requiring a blood transfusion. Other risks of lower back surgery could include things such as bowel or bladder dysfunction, or a spinal fluid leak requiring repair. There's also a risk of anesthesia, a risk of a heart attack, risk of blood clot formation, there's a risk of pneumonia, and there's always a small risk of death. I realize that this list may seem very daunting to you, but I have performed thousands and thousands of spine surgeries over the past 20 years, and so I feel comfortable in telling you that I think you will do well from your surgery. But I can never say 100% there couldn't be a complication. That's a part of having surgery and there's always that small risk. 